Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here this Thursday night, live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake. Also playing live over SPNN in St. Paul. Uh, it's great to have you. Of course, it replays in many other areas, uh, Stillwater, Roseville, uh, those cable channels out there. And uh, we're glad to have you aboard. Another fascinating informational show, educational show. I want to put that in there uh, specifically because the main topic we're talking about tonight is cameras in the courtroom. We've talked about this before at the federal level, what they're trying to do, and, and also on another show about uh, Minnesota Supreme Court candidate Michelle McDonald, who wanted a camera in her courtroom. She wanted her courtroom to be uh, taped for her trial for drunk driving, which was denied. And so the public does not get to see her trial. You had to show up and be there at a specific time and sit there uh, during working hours so you could not see that hearing. You have to go based off what I'm saying or based off what anybody else is saying that the press is saying about it. You could not observe it with your own eyes unless you were there. Um, but that is considered a public hearing. Uh, uh, but it is limited in its scope. And with the progression of technology in TV and cameras in video and the Internet, much, many more people can watch these court hearings, and it could be more public uh, than, be, than ever before without the filters of the press, because now you can go and watch it online. Oh, wait, you can't. I forgot. Yeah, they don't film the courtrooms. Um, what they do at the Minnesota Supreme Court. All right, but we're going to talk about this cameras in the courtroom because there was a hearing in the Minnesota Supreme Court last Tuesday as to whether cameras should be allowed for all post-criminal convictions sentencing hearing. In other words, once you've been convicted of a crime, you know, a month later, a day later, depending on when the court decides, a week later, um, there's a sentencing hearing. And what this hearing was about is some people wanted all sentencing hearings for criminal cases televised. Excuse me, not televised, but the, the video media could record it. it doesn't, it's up to the uh, TV stations or the Internet stations as to whether they want to put it on the air or not. The government can't tell us what to do or you what to do in that matter. Um, but the government is telling us we can't videotape that. So now they're trying to change the rules, but it's a very, very narrow, narrow window, <laughs> very tiny window for all cameras. Uh, and as one of my friends who's been on the show uh, has said, uh, Don Mashek, who's a part of the press who writes, this is about engineering a verdict. You know, that's what it boils down to. So we're going to talk about that because there was drama in the Minnesota Supreme Court. I was part of that drama, and um, I ended up, well, I don't know if I won. I got to videotape uh, anyway. So we're going to see some of that hearing take place and give a dis have a discussion on that, and I think you'll find it fascinating what certain people think about the constitutional idea of freedom of the, pr freedom of the press and, of course, Minnesota's Constitution is that the right of the press shall remain inviolate. Oh, wait, you're not going to find out about that because that wasn't talked about in the hearing. It wasn't mentioned, so, uh, oh, well. Uh, but you'll get my opinion on that uh, in there. Uh, so, but other things happened this week. and Actually, a lot happened on Tuesday uh, because... This hearing for cameras in the courtroom took place Tuesday morning, the 16th. And prior to that, I went down to, uh, prior to that hearing, I went down to the 
post office of the House of Representatives, and then the Senate. Now, the Senate has moved their post office from out of the Capitol building. They moved it over to uh, where the, actually, it's the same office where the Republican uh, Party uh, used, to be, used to be. Now that's the Senate uh, offices and the post office is over there. So you have to walk a block north of the Capitol, um, no, you know, uh, to, to go there. I don't know what other Senate offices are going to be over there because the Capitol's under construction. But the reason I went over there is because I dropped off this uh, little flyer, not very big, and you don't need to see it. I mean, we've heard about it, you've seen about it on, on our show, but this flyer about uh, Carver, no, Scott County Judge Carolyn Lennon, uh, who never signed her oath of office for, or gave an oath of office for three years. Okay, and that's a violation of the U.S. Constitution Article 6 relating to debts, supremacy, and oaths. It says, the senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers, judicial officers of both the United States and of the several states shall be bound by oath or affirmation. She wasn't bound for three years and it was brought to her attention and to recuse herself from a court case by someone who's been on our show, John Miser. She refused. The chief judge of the county of the judicial district refused to remove her from the bench and from the case. And so did the appellate courts and so did the Supreme Court. We got lawlessness in our courts. We are ruled by people, not by indiscriminate people rather than the law. We're ruled by men rather than the law, and that's not the way we're supposed to be. All right, but what happens when a judge doesn't sign their oath? Minnesota Statutes 351.02, every office shall become vacant on the happening of either of the following events. The incumbent's refusal or neglect to take the oath of office or to give or renew the official bond. Ref refusal or neglect. And the reason neglect is in there because it doesn't matter because you don't know whether it's refusal or not. And so it just doesn't matter because they can say, oh, I forgot. Really, did you, or were you refusing? All right, okay. Then uh, it later states what happens when, uh, who gets to go after, and it's the Attorney General, it's also the legislature, that gets to go after these judges that don't sign their oath, or anybody, city council, every executive officer, all those people need to sign their oath. So I handed that out, and then I went over after that, went over to the Minnesota Supreme Court. After that, cameras in the court hearing. And then after that, I ran up to, uh, where was that? In, in uh, Blaine, the Mermaid. There was a Tea Party meeting up there. And Sheriff Mack, a, a county sheriff from, I don't know what county, but in Arizona, was giving a presentation before the Tea Party, and we got a little clip of his that uh, uh, one of our producers put together and filmed. And we're going to play that because it's fa this is about states' rights, and this is how he stood up against the federal government. And he took the federal government to court, and, and the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in his favor and made some dramatic statements and here's a little story about how he dealt with the federal government in his county. And it's too bad there weren't any other county sheriffs that came because 30 were invited. There's 87 counties in Minnesota. 30 were invited, and none of them showed up. Uh, other of, uh, officers were there. But let's hear what uh, Sheriff Mack had to say. When I was sheriff, while I was suing the federal government, we needed to fix a bridge. The Army Corps of Engineers came in and they said, you can't touch that bridge. We own that river. The Gila River is ours. 
And they said, the county commissioner said, well, we have people who live over on the north side of the bridge. We got to take care of them. Said, sorry, we have to do our environmental impact studies. <laughs> Ten months later, still not fixed. The board of supervisors, county commissioners, voted unanimously to fix the bridge. Army Corps of Engineers says, we're going to arrest all of you. They're going to arrest. I wasn't even involved in this. Didn't want to get involved in this. And they come in and say they're going to arrest people in my county without my permission, <laughs> without talking to me, without offering me a bribe. <laughs> that ain't right. So, so uh, then they said, we're going to arrest all the maintenance workers. Some of those guys were my friends. And they're going to go to jail now just for fixing a bridge and helping the people. And so I called the Army Corps of Engineers. And, oh, and they said, they're, they're going to charge us $50,000 a day and arrest everybody. Why don't they just make it a million a day? You know, what's the matter with it? So we're going to get fined $50,000 a day. They're going to arrest the, the county commissioners and arrest the maintenance workers. So I called the Army Corps of Engineers into my office. And I said, I want you to know I really get along with all people and I've never hurt anybody. In 20 years of law enforcement, I never beat anybody up or never shot him. I never hurt anybody, ever, never hurt anybody. And, uh, and, and so I said, I really want to keep that record going. <laughs> but, but I'm telling you right now, you can, you can look up my lawsuit against the federal government if you want to. I'm already suing you guys, but this time I'm not suing. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you try to arrest anybody in my county, I will call out the posse. I will call out all our deputies. I will do anything I have to. I'll call in the other sheriffs from the other counties and we'll arrest every one of you. And, and so I said, I don't want that to happen, but we're going to fix the bridge. Okay. And so they left town. We fixed the bridge. We didn't pay a dime in fine and nobody went to jail. And isn't that how it's supposed to work? Yeah. This separation of the two spheres, what two spheres are we talking about? The federal and state, is one of the Constitution's structural protections of liberty. State sovereignty, my dear friends, the Tenth Amendment, is a structural protection of liberty. Why? Because it's the ultimate check and balance. All right, I, I bring this, uh, I bring them up, and, th and that's why I also mentioned the oath issue because there was a group of uh, sheriffs, deputies, police officers that are called oath keepers, and and they were there. And the the purpose of oath keepers is to keep your oath to what you swore to, which is the defend the Constitution of the United States and, of course, Minnesota's Constitution, and. And that's why I bring up Justice Judge, excuse me, Judge, Judge Lennon um, issue uh, of not signing her oath. And then, of course, Sheriff Mack here, who understood and understands the Constitution. And it was just a great explanation of, and he had a lot more examples than just the, the bridge issue of, uh, hey, federal government, you're not coming in here and arresting anybody. I'm the law, the chief lawmaker, and and don't do it. And and they didn't. He always threatened them. Now I understand here. He he made some jokes, and there are people out there who will take these jokes and misconstrue them and twist them. And that that happened on my show when I had Dan Severson, who was running for the Secretary of State. Um, Blue Stream Perry ran a clip of our show where Dan made a joke about, uh, you know, he has this program he wanted to implement that you can, if you have this uh, ID card, you can go in and swipe it. You can go vote right away. You're all set to go versus going through the line. You may have to wait out in the cold for two hours. It was a joke, but they said, oh, here's this plan to leave people out in the cold. And, you know, they weren't joking. Uh, but that's the type of thing happens. So some of this joking in here, uh, you got to understand it as that. But I don't doubt for a second that somebody's going to misconstrue that. But here's the chief law enforcement officer of his county, 
uh, not lawmaker, <laughs> law enforcement officer, and he understands. And just his whole testimony in explaining how the county sheriff is number one uh, in that county. And the federal government has no say over a county sheriff. And actually, the federal government has no say over any state. And if the state and if, if the federal government passes a law and says, state, you have to comply, a state can say, no, I don't. And I won't. And we won't. And that was part of his, what was written in the ruling, where he had, uh, it's called the Prince ruling. So if you want to do, look that up, P-R-I-N-T-Z. And it was uh, another county sheriff, Prince and Mac. Uh, versus the United States, and it basically restored the Tenth Amendment. Uh, but you can look that up. He had a little booklet on it there. Fascinating reading. And so <laughs> it was just a good hearing, a, a good time at the Tea Party event. Other issues were talked about, like uh, Agenda 21, which is all about getting rid of states' right and coming underneath the United Nations and the people who are involved in that who are working for it. I do not like Jeb Bush one bit because he's part of that. He's part of that Common Core. He's part of that United Nations. He, you know, we, we've been in a system so long and we didn't grow up with it. We don't realize that the federal government only exists because we have a, a conglomerate of states that came together to put the federal government in place. And when they put the federal government in place, they put it in place in such a way that the states maintain their authority and gave limited authority to the federal government. But the federal government is acting in a different direction. They've really teamed up with corporations and uh, become more of a corporate state than individual states. So, um, and this whole idea of at least uh, the Agenda 21 under the UN is to get rid of even the federal or national rights. So you just have the United Nations as the ruling body over all, all states, all nations. And we can't do that. We can't afford to do that. We will lose our liberties. Uh, the rights will no longer come from God. They'll come from man. And we know what happens when the rights come from man. Uh, so, fascinating hearing. Well, that gets us back into cameras in the courtroom. Now, I've filmed in the Supreme Court before, I've filmed in the appellate court, have not filmed in district court, uh, I've tried, they won't let me, and it's just it's too bad because you can't see what's going on. Well, one thing about filming in the Minnesota Supreme Court, if it's a court case, uh, they're all public hearings, but public hearing in a courtroom is different than a public hearing in the legislature. Why? I do not know. They treat them differently and why the court does. Now, if I go to a public hearing down at the legislature, I just show up. I go in and the hearing can be going on. I set up my camera. I'm courteous. I try to set up my camera outside, get it all done. If the hearing's already going on, I just start filming. And if I need to leave, I leave. Press does that all the time down at the legislature. And also, if I want to testify, if there's a hearing on a bill, uh, I can get my name on that list, call in ahead and get a reserve spot to testify, or I can just show up. And say, hey, I, I, I want to testify. Because one, one thing they ask, is there anybody in the audience that has anything else they want to say and add to this issue? And then you can get just, hey, yes, I would like to. But not so in the Minnesota Supreme Court. They have this uh, process that they do. Of course, everything's a process. But for them, they because of their black robes and because it's a pomp and circumstance more. It's more of this uh, show and it's more of, boy, we're really official about this and our decorum is in such a way that, you know, this is really top elite intellectual debate going on here. Yeah, a lot of it is, uh, very much so, but 
uh, not necessarily so either uh, because of the pomp. It's just a little bit too much piousness uh, going on in there. So anyway, they have a rule. Uh, in this case, you had to, for the hearing on December 16th, you had to file, if I get the date right, November 18th, you had to have your written request in, or your request in, uh, if you wanted a written submission or if you wanted to speak at this hearing, uh, you had to, you know, do it by November 18th. If you didn't, it was untimely, Okay. So you could not show up the day of and say, hey, I have something to add to this that I think needs to be added. So they call it a public hearing in the court, but it's not a public hearing. Uh, you go down to your city council, and do you get a public hearing? What happens? They have visitors' presentations where you can come in, or if there's a subject matter that they're talking about and going to make a vote on, you get to have input on that at some time as part of the public, but not so the Supreme Court. And for a public hearing relating to administrative law, and I could understand a court case because there you have two sides pitting against each other and they're the ones in the case. But a person can file a friend of the court brief and there's requirements around that. So here we go, and, but they have this rule for cameras in the courtroom. Of course, this whole hearing is about should we have cameras in the courtroom, and they have this out rule that you got to notify them 24 hours in advance. And I know they have that rule for court cases, but this was a public hearing, and I filmed at other public hearings. Uh, you know, they have committees on domestic violence, they have committees on press you know, where justices show up and they have appellate court. But this was before the whole Supreme Court, so it was a little different in that respect. But still, it was a public discussion, public hearing. I went and filmed. I didn't give them 24-hour notice because I didn't know much about this hearing ahead of time. And I just showed up with my camera. I walk into the courtroom about uh, 15 minutes before the hearing start. And the uh, information technology director or one of their staff uh, pulled, you know, just says, uh, is that on and are you planning to film the hearing? And I said, no, it's not on, which was a big mistake. I should have left it on because I would have recorded the conversation. We're in a public building, public courthouse, no hearings going on. And I said, no, I'm not recording and uh, I am filming this hearing. And he goes, well, you didn't give 24-hour notice. And I says, why do I need to give 24-hour notice for a public hearing? He says, well, that's our rules. Well, you can't make that rule because I have a right as a press to be in that courtroom and film because that's my medium. I don't remember half these things they say. I can't write it down fast enough. And then when they say it, I can't read it, you know? And also, I want you to see what's going on in that courtroom and, and hear what's being said. So that was one of the issues that came up, whether this was um, educational or not. Okay, uh, so I was untimely, okay, according to them. He wasn't going to allow me to film. And then I, and, and I, and I asked the question, well, what happens if I film anyway? Well, we'll call the we'll tell the Supreme Court, and they'll probably call the police. And, and I said, well, then am I going to be under arrest? And he answered, well, that's up to the police, you know. <laughs> and so I decided right then I, I'm not going to deal with that. Uh, but then I went over to uh, uh, County Attorney Backstrom was there from Dakota County, and I just said, um, oh. I, and I, I told him, you can't do this. The right, of, not uh, the uh, in, information technology director. The right of the press shall remain inviolate in Minnesota. That means you can't, you can't put restrictions on the press in a public setting, in a public hearing. And we get to do this. And um, so I turned to Mr. Backstrom and I said, Mr. Backstrom, or are you, I, I didn't know, I couldn't remember his name. I says. Are you still a county attorney? And he goes, yes, I am. It says, I just, did you hear this conversation? You know they're not going to let me film here and denying me the freedom of the press. And he says, well, I don't have uh, jurisdiction here. I, 
you don't have anything to do with what they said. And I, and I just said, hey, well, no, I'm just letting you know. You heard the conversation. I'm just connecting with you. So I, I know you know that you heard the conversation. And yeah, yeah, you know. So, um, and then I walked out of the room. And then the uh, information technology director left. Nice guy. I mean, I've worked well with him before. Oh, but before I walked out of the room, I said, you know what? Why don't you just waive the rules? The rules don't, I mean, you don't have to do these rules. Is anybody filming in here? And he goes, no, nobody's asked to film. I said, are you filming? Yes, we're filming. What? The state can film, but the free press can't film? What's going on here? See, it's a serious flaw in their thinking. The state has the right not to press. Okay, it's just, it's just a huge ah, flaw in their thinking. Well, um, you know, that got to them a little bit. You just kind of go, hmm, th there is something interesting about that. And so he, he left, and... Uh, he actually went back and talked to the Supreme Court, and I'm taking my camera apart, and then he comes back and he says, all right, uh, they're going to waive the rule, and you can film. Can you get your camera done in five minutes? Sure, no problem. So I got in there set up, and, and you're going to see what took place, because then at the beginning of the hearing, uh, let's play the camera in the courtroom video. This is what the Chief Justice Lori Gilday said. Good morning. Please be seated. We have one matter for hearing. This morning, a hearing on proposed amendments to the general rules of practice. Um, the record should reflect that we have received a request to record today's proceedings. The request did not comply with our 24-hour notice um, requirement. However, under Rule 134.10, I am authorized to waive that notice uh, requirement, and I am waiving it and allowing the proceedings to be recorded. All right. There it is. Allowing proceeding. We're waiving the rule according to... Rule 134.10. So the rule is discriminant based on the chief justice there. Uh, and maybe the other judges had to vote, justices had to vote on it. I don't know. Uh, but they let me film. So that was a, a, a victory there. But what, it, what was interesting that happened is while I was out taking the camera down, this man came by. His name is Tom Linder. He's from Indiana had been in Minnesota is my understanding, my recollection, and, uh, or Ohio, you know, Indiana is what I remember, and he, he'd been dealing with this issue, and he, he said, I heard the conversation that you had, and I've been fighting this for a long, long time, and actually in uh, Indiana, it's going to be Indiana or Ohio, see if I had this on film I can remember, but... Uh, and uh, you're going to know why I'm confused here <laughs> a little bit, because Ohio also has cameras all the time in the courtroom for everything, nothing. And they've had no problems, according to uh, Tom Lind Linder, and then also according to uh, this guy from the Star Tribune, uh, who knows all about Ohio or Indiana. And he came over and just said, hey, I heard you, way to fight for it. I think this is ridiculous. Uh, that they don't have cameras here in Minnesota, but I heard your conversation and way to go, way to put up the good effort. And then, uh, so I come back in, set up the camera, and then when the hearing's all done, I'm, he comes over and talks over to me and says, you made it, you fought the good fight, and you won. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, and, and I appreciate your support, and thanks for uh, encouraging me <laughs> in this battle. Uh, you know, we got to do it all over again. You know, the founding fathers did it, and and as Thomas, uh, as uh, Ben Franklin said, uh, it's yours if you can keep it, and that's what we have to do because there's people that don't want to see. They don't want the bad deeds that they do come out to the public light. Okay, and I'm not saying anybody on the Supreme Court is doing this, okay, because they actually film their court cases. Uh, so, but in the district court level, we don't get to see what's taking place in that district court. And, and of course, you can film the appellate court, but they don't film for you. The state doesn't do that, uh, and it should be. And so, anyway, so they started off the court hearing, 
uh, for amending the general rules of practice uh, with my being able to film there. Okay, so let's get into some of this video. We got a lot of video and, uh, the, oh, we got a phone call. I'm sorry. Uh, caller, do you have a comment or question? Yeah, Tim, it's Rich Neumeister. How hey, Rich, how you doing? Doing all right. Good. Just, anyways, I, I just have to ask a question or two, if you may know. Sure. On the 24-hour rule, uh, whether from your own experience or if you know of anyone else, has anyone been denied because they give, you know, they give 24-hour notice? Uh, maybe it's someone like you who, you know, is not the traditional press, but a press person filming, and they deny that person? I don't know uh, if they have or not. Um, I have not heard of any. I have never been turned down with when I've done it uh, well in advance of the 24-hour notice. Uh, and I know those guys there, if you call at, let's say this hearing was at 11, but if you called at 10.59 the day before, they'd let you film. Okay. And, then, and, and they would, you know, even probably if you're a couple hours after, they, I, I don't think <coughs> they would hold it solid. The, then the other question I have real quick is, uh, I'm aware that the Supreme Court does tape. Yes. I'm also aware that the appeals court also tape or audio tape? They audio tape, yes. But in, in the past, I wanted access to those audio tapes. Won't do it. And, and I was denied. Yes, unbelievable. And that's an issue for me. Yep. And then secondly, when I pressed it, and as you know, I press a lot of things. Yes, I'm, you do. A lot of people. But they said, the, this is basically to help the judges uh, when they're doing their opinion. It's basically for... Uh, not educational, but for remembrance purposes. Sure. And I think that needs to be dealt with. But the one, uh, one thing I'm aware of, I understand that the Supreme Court videotapes are either put online or yes. available to the public. Yes, Is that correct? absolutely. Yeah, very easy to find. Uh, you go to the Minnesota Judicial Branch. I Google that, and then you click on their home page. On the left-hand side, click Min the Supreme Court and then over on the right hand it will have uh, you know videos that you can watch and then you can go search for them. All right well I'm much obliged to you I'm sure I'll more than likely see you in 2015 at the, <laughs> at the Capitol. Well let's let's uh, hope so and hopefully we can make some good changes there um, but anybody can go in and film in the appellate court with notice and so there is a capability of it be re being recorded if you have the time, the energy, the money to do it, you get you can do it. So there isn't that there is not a restriction. But I mean, they're already recording it. You know what? Attorneys defending their clients can't even get a copy of that audio tape to hear what the judges said and the questions they asked. If they want to appeal the appellate court. Now, to the appellate court's decision to the Supreme Court, there's no transcript, there's no audio tape. It's just the decision that's written down. So, interesting to, to say the least. But let's go to the district court. Okay, uh, boy, I forgot who I have on my list who's speaking first. Well, actually, um, I want to go with Davis first. Oh, Walker. You know, let's go with Davis first, if you don't mind, um, because uh, he was the, for the uh, Star Tribune, and he um, gave why we should have cameras in these uh, sentencing hearings. Uh, so, and I think he made some good points, so let's hear what he has to say. Um, Mr. Davis, you have... Five minutes and 41 seconds. <laughs> I'm Hal Davis. I'm Can you a board just pull, member the, of the, pull the microphone down? There we go. I'm Hal Davis. I am a board member of the Minnesota Coalition on Government Information. I'm also team leader for public safety reporting at the St. Paul Pioneer Press. Minkoji agrees with the arguments presented by Alita Walker on behalf of the Star Tribune Media Company. We'd like to address the remarks by the dissenters on the committee. 
They wrote, the public is not demanding increased coverage. The demand is coming from media companies whose goals will be more about higher ratings than public education. Because the media will utilize only snippets of the most salacious courtroom events, expanded coverage will not increase public knowledge of courtroom processes. Minkoji does not agree that this will be the likely outcome. The potential for bad journalism by some is not a reason to make it more difficult for others to do good journalism. If journalists do latch on to salacious events, at least with the audio and visual record, the public has the opportunity to judge for itself what happened and will be less reliant on the journalist's interpretation. And to judge by the stories they click on when they visit Twin Cities. All right. Here's what I would say to these people to say, it's really salacious, they're just doing it for ratings. Uh, public is not demanding, well, I am. Uh, as part of the public, uh, these videos. Um, my answer to that would be, it does not matter. It doesn't matter if it's salacious. It doesn't matter if it's for ratings. It doesn't matter that the public's not demanding it. It's a public hearing. We have already in our Constitution, the right of the press shall remain inviolate. You as a justice don't get to change that. You as a judge don't get to change that. We've already told you what to do. Are you going to be an oath keeper or an oath denier? That's not an oath keeper. Uh, someone that never swore an oath. Okay? And I, I just, um, and it doesn't describe also what Speechless does. I want to educate you. That's my goal on this show. I, I for time purposes, yes. Do I have to edit it? Absolutely. But my goal is to put these things, and all these hearings will eventually be up on, on, um, on my website there, and that's why I put the graphic up there on YouTube. And uh, we do very long clips. They're not 20-second clips, as you'll see. Uh, we'll be playing the whole thing. All right, keep going here. These.com, the website of the Pioneer Press, the public is demanding coverage of public safety. The top three videos of 2014 were public safety stories with potential for court activity. Um, among them, the Eric Hightower police arrest, we had police videos, a man who claimed abuse by Roseville police. In fact, six of the top 10 stories clicked on were public with, with video were the public safety stories, including nurses assaulted at a St. John's hospital, the Lolly Skyway arrest security footage, which got a lot of attention in St. Paul, and uh, some jewelry store robbery security footage. This suggests that they will also wish to see the resolution of these events through the judicial system. I spent most of my career covering the judicial system. Journalists convey much of what happens in a courtroom, but their accounts are by definition secondhand. To quote Al Tompkins of the Pointer Institute, there are some side benefits to having cameras in the courtroom. The public will hold journalists more accountable for the accuracy of coverage. At least some members of the public will have listened word for word to what the journalists witnessed. Coverage is less likely to be spun, positioned, or slanted when everyone has access to the unfettered truth. News organizations, radio, television, newspapers, have websites that allow streaming of the entire proceedings, not just sound bites. Absent being in the courtroom, we submit the audio and video record is the best evidence. All right, Thank come you. back to me. Um, come, uh, sir, before, before you, yes. you uh, leave. All right. And we want to really get to this uh, Justice Lilyhog question here uh, because it's important. Um, I covered a number of cases, um, but here he's talking about one. Here, here's the issue. Nurses assaulted at St. John's. Okay, there was video on that. Okay, and, and that video went to a website, um, a newspaper website, covered. This is right here in the Maplewood area. Okay, and it's interesting. The, the hospital's video got released, but the police video of what they have for what they did is not being released by Officer Sh Chanel um, and the police chief of Maplewood, and it should be released. Why, why does he pick and choose, you know? And people would want to see that, and it needs to be released. So 
I mean, it's, it's public information, it's public data. We need to see what our public officials did during this time. Did they overreact? And my, yeah, I think they overreacted on There's no way they needed to, to kill this guy. Uh, but they did, but it could have been part of the hospital's fault too, you know, because they had him on medications that he had a bad reaction to. Is that what happened? I, that's my understanding. But this guy has never behaved this way before and he was having a medical condition. And so, uh, and he didn't have any weapons in his hands either. So, but my point is there, uh, here, yeah, people wanna see these things, they wanna know, and they wanna make decisions for themselves. And it's the same thing that's happened with Ferguson, with the New York um, uh, man that was choked to death, uh, and a legal chokehold was put on him. I don't care what Sean Hannity says. It was an illegal chokehold. Uh, I don't know how he gets that. It was all legal, but um, just treated, treated bad. People want to make their own decisions they want to see, but they are restricted from seeing. And side benefit, it's irrelevant. Benefits, Curses, blessings, whatever, it's irrelevant to the issue. We have the freedom of the press, and the purpose of the freedom of the press is to hold the government accountable. And when the government says, no, you can't, there's only one reason. And that's the only reason that came out in this thing. We don't want people to know. We don't want people to know what happened. Because we'll be too embarrassed, we didn't do things right, they don't have the right to know, whatever. It's not, it's just too bad. Okay, uh, Justice Liliog asks, asks a very interesting question here. And um, so let's go and finish this here, tape here as to what he has to say. The podium. We've had two presentations, one from a major media company and you work for a major media company. But it strikes me that the definition of media is quite different than it was seven years ago and might well include um, bloggers who wish to post live video or recorded video on their websites, uh, people have cable TV shows uh, where, where long form video may be important. Could, could you address uh, the change in the media landscape and how you think that cuts with respect to the proposal that's before the court? Yeah, I think the change cuts in favor of transparency. Um, with streaming, for example, people can see live as it happens or on recording, everything that happens in the courtroom from gavel to gavel. This to me is an improvement in coverage. Um, seeing what actually happens in the courtroom, I think is an improvement over people standing outside the courtroom and telling people what happened inside the courtroom. Um, there's been an Im increase in live coverage. The Uptake is one of the uh, organizations in Minnesota that provides coverage of proceedings and I find it I find it educational I can't be everywhere so it's good to be able to watch a committee proceeding from gavel to gavel and see actual testimony instead of just relying on reporters with limited space might tell you afterwards I would say the change in the media landscape actually argues in favor of more transparency thank you mr. David so so important here that discussion well, the definition of media hasn't changed. Media is getting information out to people. The means of getting that information out to people has changed and become more elaborate, more extensive, and more target sensitive. You can actually target people a lot better. So the technology has changed significantly. And of course he mentions cable TV, uh, long form videos. Hey, that's us. Okay. And actually, one of the only shows. As a matter of fact, I don't know of any other one that deals with court cases and shows uh, videos from court cases. I know there are in, in uh, Hennepin County and the, the local cable over there. They have some judge shows where some of the judges get on and, and, and talk, uh, but they're not really showing video of court cases. So, it's, but it's a repeat, you know. Mine's the only consistent show that does this. 
and and uh, but the press, the written press, is writing more, and they would love to do videos of the courtroom. They'd love to, uh, because you know it doesn't matter. They get to. It's to check and balance on our governments. And his key thing here is transparency, letting the public see what goes on in that courtroom. I can't be there, and this is a way. Now, in this courtroom, there were a lot of people that were there to, uh, to watch. Actually, Michelle McDonald, who ran for the Supreme Court, showed up because she's got a lawsuit going against the courts about not letting her show or her trial be heard or seen or video recorded. And um, so she wanted to hear the conversation here. Uh, but I would say there was probably 40 people in the courtroom. And this show has the potential to get out to a lot more people than that, that couldn't be there, that couldn't see it. And I'm going to put this whole hearing on the website so that you can see it in bits and pieces or the whole thing at one time. That takes up a lot of space. But you, you know, and uh, you know, web space and and data. But you need to see this, and so it will be there. And it's irrelevant whether it's educational or not; it doesn't matter. And and that's see part of a part of the ruse in all of this. It just doesn't matter if it's educational or not. So I don't. The press says that yeah, it would be educational, but so what? You know, they're, they're trying to battle the, the, the people that are fighting against them. Um, so, and of course the big point there, the, no filter. You, you heard what he said. Um, otherwise, I'm filtering what he had to say. All right, so somebody against this. Uh, let's go to uh, Freeman, uh, County Attorney Michael Freeman, and hear what he has to say. Hennepin County Attorney. Uh, next, we have uh, prosecutor representatives who have 15 minutes. It's my understanding, um, Mr. Freeman, that you're going to take eight minutes. That is correct, Your Honor. May it, Madam Chief Justice, may it please the court. I'm Michael Freeman, Hennepin County Attorney. Here with me today is Jim Backstrom, Dakota County Attorney, as well as uh, John Kingry, Executive Director of the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, who have voted once again unanimously to oppose any changes in the present rules of cameras in the courtroom. I've been here before and have been part of this process before. There's a letter in the record from January 2008 when Lenny Castro, now Ramsey County District Judge, but then 4th Judicial District Public Defender and I spoke out to the court and asked them not to change cameras in the courtroom. There's a letter in the record from May 2009 between myself and Bill Ward when he was 4th District Public Defender, again opposing changes and more cameras in the courtroom. And there's a letter of December 2010 when I was president of the County Attorneys Association reflecting the position then and the position now of the County Attorneys Association strongly uh, supporting no changes. And today I speak with the support of Mary Moriarty, the present 4th District Public Defender, in urging no changes in, uh, for this court not to adopt the report just presented by Judge Wernick. We're back here again. In 2011, the committee split 16 to 3, opposing, suggesting no changes. In 2013, the committee was reconstituted, um, and we're back here today to talk about that. Let me say, um, Judge Wernick, uh, thank you for your good work on your report. We miss you in Hennepin County. We wish you were still sitting with us. And this re recommendation is at least a bit more narrowed. And it provides some help for victims who don't want to participate. But members of the court, I can get a 95% vote of all the prosecutors in the state of Minnesota to oppose any changes. We don't believe cameras in the courtroom help. If you talk to public defenders, you talk to a private defense bar, you talk to most district court judges, they oppose more cameras in the courtroom. The principal question to me and to think to all of us is do these changes proposed make the system more just? Does it make it work better? How does it add to justice and at what cost? 
From our lens as prosecutors and the lens of the people we work with, any additional TV make it harder for victims to report crimes, harder for witnesses to participate in trials, and more TV will make jurors more uncomfortable to serve. Mr. Freeman, I wonder in light of what you just said, why is it that we see you on TV so often then? Well, Madam Chief Justice, I thought you might ask that question. And you'll see me on TV addressing the cases that we charge and after the case is over. I don't comment after that initial presentation and I don't comment during the trial. But the public wants to know what's happening and whether they're prosecuting. <laughs> I thought that was a great question by the Chief Justice. And I don't think, and I'm not positive about this, but I remember the censor trial because I paid a lot of attention to that. Uh, Joe Sensor's wife, um, because Joe's is just a fantastic guy, and um, it's just a hard thing for the family. Of course, for the family that got killed, uh, uh, the the man who got killed. Uh, but I know Joe Sensor's very, very upset at Michael Freeman because Michael Freeman used the press to. Uh, give wrong statements about what actually happened and Mac actually according to Joe Sensor from what I've heard uh, says that Michael Freeman and you've read this in the press uh, said statements that were false and he knew they were false but I don't think Michael Freeman just did talked once on that case now I'm gonna have to do some checking on it I'm saying I'm not sure but he didn't do just when they were charged and then just after the verdict he talked a number of number of times in this but he used the press to affect the judgment okay so the fact that he even talked to them at all so why does he get to do the talking and why doesn't the press get to go in that courtroom and show what's really going on so now I gotta take all make all my decision making based on what Michael Freeman says so who made him God who made him king that everything he says is truth you know what? That's not the way it works. Here is an oath keeper. He's not an oath keeper. Here's a guy who swore an oath to defend the cause and protect the Constitution, and he's saying no cameras in the courtroom because it just doesn't help. It's harder to report crimes. He doesn't, all of it, everything he said is irrelevant. The purpose of cameras in the courtroom is because we have it in the Constitution and it's to protect the citizens from the government. So there's transparency and the citizens get to see what the government is doing, like Michael Freeman, who's part of the government, and to hold him accountable, but he doesn't want to be held accountable. That's what's really going on in my mind. And that's why this is atrocious. Okay, let's uh, play a couple more minutes are charging the cases of the crime reports that the media reports through police sources. And at the conclusion, I either suggest that the person has been found guilty and deserved it, or if in the cases that go to conclusion in which the jury disagree with the prosecutors, I take our licks and I support the system, which I firmly believe in. But there are no witnesses in the pictures when I'm presenting. There are no victims in the pictures I'm presenting or talking with them. There are no jurors. And when I'm talking to this court as sincerely as I can about what happens when we have discussions with the victims, when we have discussions and try to get witnesses to come forward and how scared they are to come forward and how TV, their appearance on TV will just make it more difficult. Now people do do their service as, as juries, as jurors. All right. <sighs> That happens before there are cameras. And according to the, uh, the Mr. Davis and Mr. Lindner, Ohio and Indiana, it's just not a problem. If a person has a problem going before the cameras, or the person has a problem going in the court from the beginning. It has nothing to do with the cameras. They've been doing it. You don't even know the cameras are there. Matter of fact, you know, even in the Supreme Court hearing, you know, I know where the cameras are. I know where one of them is because it's above their heads and you can see it. It's looking down uh, for the people making the presentation. But the other ones you don't see. 
Matter of fact, every single courtroom already has a camera in the courtroom. That's the big lie that they're not telling about. I can't say it's a lie. It's part of the smoke and mirrors. Every single courtroom already has a camera in it. And they're used to convict people of disorderly conduct or to free them from disorderly conduct from bad prosecutors who are trying to frame people saying they were disorderly conduct when they weren't, as happens in Dakota County for where Backstrom is. Uh, I mean, so, yes, were cameras in the Constitution? Absolutely not. But there was the principle of an open, transparent reporting, freedom of the press. And now you get to see what's going on. Oh, no, you don't. It's sad. Okay, so we got a little bit more clip here, and then uh, we'll wrap her up. And they do, but a lot of them want to remain anonymous. They don't want their pictures and faces there. Well, counsel, um I don't understand this proposal as mandating a pilot project that would allow the portions of trials to be televised that involve jurors. What I understand the proposal to be is that it's primarily focused with regards to sentencing. And in, in that regard, I'd like... All right, we got to wrap it up here. We're out of time. Of course, this proposal was very limited. Uh, and so it had nothing to do with jurors or anything like that. But of course, Freeman was start trying to make that case show everything you know what it's not it's actually gonna help who wants their picture up there who wants to be convicted of a crime but what if it's a false allegation we didn't even get into that aspect the cameras could free somebody wrongly convicted all right remember if you don't stand up for other people's liberties who's gonna stand up for yours and good men don't do nothing God bless have a great week said to me that you wouldn't leave, but now I see that you're long gone. Sets on fire